Now inside this house, which they built by the way, outside of this facility and then rolled it in, you can see the fans out this window here. It looks like a regular house, except that we've got sensors and sensors in here with miles of cable connecting all this stuff. So here we are with Dr. Ann Cope and you're pretty much responsible for this house, right? Absolutely. Um, so as the chief engineer, I, I help us design the research projects that we're gonna do. This one included where we are measuring wind pressures all around the outside of this house. We can get over 400 sensors on a typical home and we need the level of granularity to have the good science. So it takes us a while to instrument these things um, and then we put them to the test for a number of weeks. Now, just like the blower door testing that we're always doing, we have pressure differentials being measured here. They have got all of these sensors which have the little clear uh, pressure hose which is just poking outside through the walls and apparently they're kind of hard to find so they have to mark them with paint so that they know exactly where they are. And then those are coming inside and monitoring with reference to this blue set, which is the interior pressure. Now, of course, when they start blowing on the outside of this house with all of those fans, the pressure outside the house is gonna be insane. And that's why they're measuring so many different points around it, under the eaves, on top of the roof, on the walls. But also, through leakages in the plywood sheathing of this house and through the siding if they put it on, you're gonna have the pressure inside the house change as well. And so of course, they're measuring that pressure with reference to outside or some other anchor so that we know exactly how all of the different pressures within the home and around the home are working. So we design our homes, our building codes and standards are, are designed as if the home remains intact and enclosed. Um, so if you introduce an opening, let's say a broken window or a large broken garage door, your structure is now more like a balloon than it is like an enclosed <laughs> building. And so, you know, all of that wind is going to come into that garage space. It's going to expand and push. So the inside is now trying to pop out just as much as the wind is pulling on the outside. It really dramatically increases the wind loads on the structure and leads to a lot of damage. The flexibility and movement of the, of the building products is, is critical to find out. Sure, there's some things that we can't fail in this facility and we might need a facility that can do some stronger winds um, in the future. But I tell you what, I've got a lot of things to do first <laughs> before we start thinking about that. So people who are looking for a new home, beware, because we've got two different products that are being tested on this home. And of course they're testing things in this chamber for fire, for wind damage, and wind-driven rain too. Both of these products are not really like great with water. Uh, this is OSB, which is little tiny pieces of wood that are glued together. This is basically cardboard. Um, you should be very careful about this because this is uh, approved by code because they staple it in this very specific way, and so they think it's okay, but it's only approved for the strength that it has when it's dry. So as soon as it gets wet, we have a major problem because cardboard wet is not gonna hold up your house. So we wanna be careful about all that stuff, and that is exactly what they are testing in this facility so that we can know exactly when it's worrisome enough that we need to absolutely tear the house apart to make sure that we get at this and replace it with something better. So aside from wind, which clearly we have, what else are you spraying around in here? We can do plenty of stuff in here. One thing that comes together with the wind are raindrops. So with the sprinkler system that we have here, right here in front of the fans, we can deliver eight inches per hour of you know tropical style rain to measure how does that interact and where does it go. You also play with fire. We absolutely play with fire. And the biggest thing that we research here is how do the embers get carried by the wind up and, and all around the structure there and interact with it in a realistic wind environment. That's really important for us to study. There's three things that people should really think about in terms of vulnerabilities of your home. First and foremost, the roof. Um, you want to have a class A roof and you want to keep it clear because that ember lands on top of a bunch of uh, pine needles or something like that. Now you've got a much bigger fire. So it's your roof. Uh, the second is your vents. Roof vents, um, crawl space vents, you want those to, to not allow large embers to penetrate. So we're talking about one eighth inch mesh is gonna keep the bigger embers out. We have a video using some of the footage that they've gotten here at IBHS on fire safe vents. So I'm linking that video on screen now so you can see like the actual testing on that as well. And then third, 
critical defensible space. The wind interacts with normal size homes such that it creates uh, an eddy at the bottom that's about five feet. And we know that as we take something that represents a standard flame and we move it closer and closer to the home at five feet, that's when you go down below typical ignition. So five feet from the wind, five feet from the heat from something burning next to the home, that's what you want to have non-combustible. So all those beautiful camellia bushes, all of that wood fencing, move it away from the structure more than five feet. And if you can't remember those three things, you know, the roof, the vents, and the, and the five feet, don't worry, we've combined all of our science into something called wildfire prepared home so that people can just go and look at the checklist and know what to do. Where are we now? <laughs> well, this is the hail lab. So we make and shoot hail at different building products in this lab to figure out, you know, how does, how does it stand up? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of things from the aging farm, which we saw yep. outside. So why are these in here? And I see fire, I see wave, I yeah. see sheathing experiment. So from the aging farm, we actually go out and cut the panels out and we bring them in here to the laboratory. So at five, 10, 15 years, we can test again to see how does that performance change over time against wind, against hail, against that burning brand test for fire. And so the things that I have here on the table are um, 3D scanned actual hailstones, largest piece of hail recorded in the state of Alabama. And when you study hail and people start talking about it, they, they start saving it for you. <laughs> so right. that one actually has the right mass of a hailstone. Yeah, it feels significant. Fortunately, most of the hail that does fall from the sky is, is more like that one. Terrence has shot more hailstones than any person on this planet. Really? He, absolutely, he shoots lots of building products. We've already done um, a bunch of five-year panels and the hail performance in particular, you see a lot more granule loss um, at the five-year panel. And yep, press fire when you're ready. And I'm ready for fire. <laughs> yeah. And you can feel the impact. And feel? Oh my gosh, yeah, that's quite a dent. Okay, and so for rain that comes from the sky downward, right. I'm recommending that the bigger the eave can be, the better but yeah. you know, because you're actually testing it, what that does to the pressures of the house. Does that make the roof easier to, to rip off if you know, the reeds are three feet? Well, it, it, it allows a space where, um, you know, that wind pressure is gonna come up under. And that has actually been the study uh, recently. There have been a lot of studies done to try to figure out what is that pressure because eaves are getting bigger and bigger than they have been in the past. Right. There's some proposals that just went into the wind load provisions for ASCE 7 on that exact topic. And you can see the wind pressure coming in is the same pretty much as what's up on the eave. Interesting, okay. So, uh, so if we're using like hurricane straps mm -hmm. and um, like solid, well, Mm -hmm. uh, followed, well installed sheathing and yep. framing and all that stuff, then yep. do we have anything to worry about if I go with a three or a four foot? No, beam? as long as you're designing it that way, okay. right? If you're connecting it, the strength is in the wood to do it. What, where I think people might get into trouble is that the, you know, the edge of the roof, it comes down three feet out, four feet out. How do you get the load back? You know, just make sure that the, the it, it's not sitting out too far that the load is absolutely planned to be distributed back and in, down into the wall. So if we follow the prescriptive code for structural or we get a structural engineer to say, which my structural engineer didn't, we actually put <laughs> our eaves on, bolted on after we built the structure. Right. Uh, and he was like, you can't do three feet, you can do two feet. And oh, I was, I was like, there. oh, come on, come yeah. on. But he, so, and yeah. we don't even have to worry about snow. Right. So then, so anyway, uh, do yeah. you worry about wind-driven snow or ice too? You know, Part of the provisions of the code have also just been updated for wind-driven snow um, and ice concerns because we're seeing a lot more precipitation in the past couple of years than we have. We're taking a, a, a trending look and some of those loads have recently gone up because the snow can drift, because it can move around. Um, so some of the loads that we've seen recently in the newest version of ASC 7, snow loads are going up a little bit to account for what we are seeing and how we can project things in the future. And are we worried about uh, wind-driven snow getting into the attic and causing moisture damage? The same way we're worried about embers getting in, like will a, an ember-safe vent 
also serve as a snow safe fence. Have you researched that at all? Or? So we, I haven't done that much on snow. It's, it's harder to do that here in the sure. Carolinas. And I will tell you that rain and raindrops and embers blown by the wind, they act actually in fairly similar ways. Hmm. So where you can keep embers out, where you can keep rain out, I would hypothesize you can also keep wind driven snow out. You know, wind testing facilities and musical instruments actually have a lot in common. So our fan tower, which is like the lungs, you know, for a musical instrument, we have 105 fans. Each one is just slightly taller than me and is a 350 horsepower motor. They work together and in separate groups to create realistic wind, including turbulence, right here in the turntable where we're standing. And I say they're analogous to musical instruments because those are the lungs, the inlet that speeds it up and, and channels the wind into the place where we're standing now is like the, the mouthpiece of the instrument. This area is intentionally large so as not to screw up the wind field. And that's like the body of the instrument. And then we have a bell on the outside to allow it to go out. You change those things and you get a different result on, on the building where you need the wind to be correct. Just as you would on a wind instrument as you're changing the different valves. Just as you would, yes. And my lungs can play trumpet or tuba. So if I modify the mouthpiece of the instrument and snake it down a little bit harder and get it faster, the same set of lungs could go faster or slower. It's all a matter of how does it fit together.